There are moments in every person's life when they face intense adversity. They're crucibles that forge who they become as individuals and as leaders. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are called to a higher standard, focused on leaving it better than they found it and paying it forward to the next generations. Now, let's join Fire Chief Randy Brugman as he speaks with leaders from all walks of life, as he explores and learns from their personal journeys and the crucibles that have forged them into better leaders and better people. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Leadership Crucible podcast. One of the things you may not know about me is that uh, I've been a novice drummer since uh, the age of 12. I've played in many bands throughout uh, my time and have owned uh, several uh, drum sets. In fact, I have three in my basement uh, right now. And one of those is a DW drum set. And today I have the, uh, the, two, uh, the founder and uh, co- co-founder, if you will, of DW Drums, Don Lombardi and John Good. Don Lombardi is the founder of DW Drums and Drum Channel. Don is also a dedicated educator and inventor with more than 30 patents registered to his name. Don's mission is to improve the quality of a drummer's life through education and making quality products. Don was inducted into the Guitar Center's Rock Walk on Sunset Boulevard in 2018 and most recently honored with the Percussion Arts Society President Industrial Award for 2020. In the early 1970s, seeing an ad for a drum workshop in the Yellow Pages, John Good, now DW's Vice President, signed up for lessons at age 17 to improve his drumming and reverse what he referred to as bad drumming habits. After three months of lessons, Don approached John and said, you know, I've had a lot of successful students and I don't think you're going to be one of them. John just answered, great, now what am I going to do? So Don ended up hiring John. In 2022, John and uh, Don were presented with the National Association of Music Merchants Milestone Award for 50 years of excellent service in the music product industry. You know, a drum workshop, the drummer's choice is more than a slogan, it's it's actually a fact. I've seen it as I've I've toured their plant several times. After more than 30 years of innovation and dedication to improving the way drum products are made, DW drums, pedals, and hardware have become the standard for uh, which others are measured by. To get here, it takes more than uh, working knowledge of, the, of, an, of an instrument or a few good ideas. It takes a true passion for designing and manufacturing the very best. So we're gonna talk to John and Don today about uh, their journey, uh, about how they came from uh, starting a small drum shop in Santa Monica in 1972 to having an international corporation. Hey, how we doing? We're good. <laughs> we're, we're very good. Yeah. Well, they ran nice shirt. Yeah, I was going to say, did you, what do you think? <laughs> I usually wear a, a sports coat, and I can throw one on if you'd like, but I, I wanted to wear no, this in no, honor like of both shirt. of you. <laughs> the way it is. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for uh, joining me on this uh, Leadership Crucible podcast. Uh, I've talked with John uh, quite a bit about this, Don, and you know, one of the focal points that we have um, with this podcast is to share our stories, our life journeys, if you will, and some of the adversities that we have faced uh, and the lessons that we've learned along the way for, for the next generation. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I guess I'm a believer that today we're, we're seeing a landscape where we're not sharing those experiences very well. And so... I couldn't think of uh, two more people that are two people that uh, represent, um, you know, starting with a passion and an idea and creating just a great company. And so I appreciate you being on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, wish there was a scientific background into how we got here, but just <laughs> a little bit of mind stupidity and fortitude, you know, we, and we had no other choice. You know, we had to be successful. <laughs> I don't think the, at least to me, I know the thought never occurred to me that we wouldn't be. Well, we just didn't even know where we were going. We were just trying to keep the lights on, right? We knew we were running out of money from time to time. So we always had to go back to the well and find people and call friends and family and say, hey, you know, but it was always an obstacle to get over because we were growing, which is, is a good problem to solve. 
Well, let's let's start start with where this all began. I mean, you you started a drum. Uh, I think it was in 1972. You started a small drum shop, uh, teaching shop in uh, Santa Monica. And yeah, it's, uh, 1972. I was three years old. I don't want to date <laughs> my no. I don't want to date myself too much here. Yeah, but okay, no. he was 26. I yeah okay. Now we can all got our calendar and calculators and figure that out. See how old so, we are. So yeah, we are at our 50th anniversary, by the way. Now, yeah, so awesome. And correct, it did start as a teaching studio in 1972. I was personally teaching 60, 50, 60 students a week. Uh, at that point, I was probably doing more like 40 or 50, and uh, at three different music stores and wanted to consolidate them into my own little music school and call it workshop, meaning seminars and lessons. So I thought Drum Workshop was a clever name, and we operated as an as a educational studio from 72 up until about 77, uh, and then got into manufacturing. But as a teacher, which is one of my passions that I love, which is the reason why I started a new educational website called Drum Channel. It's kind of getting me back to the roots almost with today's yeah. newer technology as opposed to people walking in. But but speaking of people walking in, I'm giving lessons one day and <laughs> who walks in? But Myself. <laughs> and uh, it's just funny because he's doing all this stuff to ramp up to get to a uh, teaching studio. I'm on my way from Michigan on a motorcycle. I just had to get there somehow. Coming to L.A. Coming to L.A. At 17 years old. I was 17. And my dad gave me $70. You know, he says, here, you're going to need some travel money. So I stayed in every Thunderbird motel that you could imagine, and it was funky. But uh, I got here, and one of the very first things I did was I wanted to better myself at what I was doing. So I met Don. And that turned into a tumultuous uh, kind of thing. By the way, the Thunderbird hotels, if they had Yelp in those days, would probably rate like a minus four. <laughs> <laughs> Thunderbird hotel sounds kind of like Vegas. Ta -da. But no, those that was, that was remember, not. Do you remember the, the bird and the yeah, the Thunderbird? Yeah. yeah. No, they he he was doing everything he could to get out here as a seventeen year old on his own just to see what life would be like and. And had and had the you know the idea of being a drummer in you. Where did you get that? Well, I got it from watching everybody play. You know, I watched uh, Danny Seraphine. I've watched uh, all these great artists, Mitch Mitchell and Chicago, big Chicago, fan, man, Chicago, huge. And I was a big fan. And lo and behold, I never knew that I'd ever be making their drums yeah. for them and become great friends. I sat right over there with Danny Seraphine, and we watched the Chicago movie. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually got to meet Danny a couple of times, and uh, very nice, just an awesome drummer. Got to watch him play at uh, NAM one time right behind him. I sat behind him for about an hour and a half and watched him play and realized how bad I was. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, so, so John comes in, knocks on the door, and wants to take lessons, I understand. So how long did it take take you to... Uh, I don't remember him knocking on the door. I remember turning around, and there's John. Yeah, yeah was there just he like, was. <laughs> what do you do here? I said, well, I, I'm a drum teacher. And that was great. He wanted to take some drum lessons. And at that point, he was working down the street, uh, potentially killing himself at a plastics factory, inhaling fumes. Yes. There was no mass, nothing. Oh, no. Not then. Yeah. Well, I had to get out of there, and uh, I went to Don, and we, you know, he's trying to teach me how to play, and I was just a terrible student because I'd go home and say, I, I don't want to play on a rubber pad. I want to play rock and roll. And so I'd go back to Don, and Don go, that's not the answer. You've got to really get the basics down. And so anyway, it just didn't work out. And so, so how did the, how did how did then it evolve to where you guys were starting into this whole manufacturing? I I had had a couple of one idea an invention before we got into doing anything together, which was uh, an adjustable trap case seat. In other words, a cylindrical seat that a drummer could sit on that filled a need because the the seats that were made back in those days 
kind of came to the drummers of the 70s out of what was manufactured for drummers in the 50s and 60s, and they weren't playing near that hard. Um, they didn't have the double bass drum thing going. So me studying with some great teachers, I knew it was really important if you're going to use your feet independent of your hands, you have to be on a solid surface. You can't be balancing yourself to fall off the stool at the same time you're trying to play drums. Uh, so, so our luminary friends who were the greatest drummers of all time, the Buddy Rich, the Louis Belson, the Ed Shaughnessy's, they would have the companies make them this canister, which was basically a big, if you will, you know, cylindrical drum, drum shell. shell, basically, that they put a seat on. And they would say, you know, what height would you like it? And not 24, 23, 22. But for the actual consumer walking in, they only made 24 inches high. Uh, and so I just thought if somebody made a great solid seat that would adjust up, because every drummer is not the same height, that's kind of a no-brainer, uh, that you could choose the height you would want to sit at or have a friend sit in and adjust it up. So I had no idea if it was going to be successful as a product, but I made one for myself. A few friends saw it. I made it for them. A few of their friends saw it. No, 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 no. I made it. Well, we were getting there, yes. <laughs> we made it for them. Then it got to a point where I was getting a couple of orders a week, and, like, I was playing six, seven nights a week, sometimes afternoons, and teaching 40, 50 students a week. And so when John was working on lessons and he was like, hey, maybe I'm not going to be the practicing eight hours a day drummer guy, I just said, we need help. You know, there's something we can do together. I think John's exact words were, what do I do now? And I said, let's help work together and you can fill these orders for these seats. And that got us into manufacturing together. And I found out he was a craftsman at that point and could make something out of nothing. Uh, so we made seats and we were successful doing that for a couple of years. Yeah, a few and years. Then, then one of my students walked in for a lesson I'd been teaching. His father picked him up and said he had the opportunity of selling his little drum company called Campco and becoming the president of Roland U.S. Uh, when they started in America, electronic yeah. drum company. Uh, so he said, do I want to dry buy all the tooling and molds? And I just, first thing I thought of is like, John can make anything. Uh, if we have this, everybody needs that pedal. The Campco pedal was the... The 5, one that 000. all the guy, the 5,000 model 5,000 camp go pedal was the one that all the pros were using. It wasn't holding up for the rock guys so much that they were having to go on to the Tama Pearl Yamaha pedals that were bigger, held up more, but didn't feel as great. So there was a void in the market for a pedal that felt really good and would last. And I just thought if we buy these tooling and dies and molds, John and I can sit there and stare at it long enough and come up with. 10 different ways to improve it. And we came up with about 20 patents over a period of years that separated us from, from everybody else. So it kind of organically grew uh, as the as the relationship grew, the company grew. Yeah. So it started out really as, uh, not only as a teacher, uh, but into the hardware business. And then, so how did then you progress to the next step where you go, well, if we're making all the hardware, because I would imagine you progress from pedals to to stands and some of the ancillary products that drummers use. Uh, well, when we're, trying to, we're, we're in the business of making hardware, but there's no stopping John about making a couple of drum sets a month just to see what they would sound like and what would happen. So it was kind of a hobby at the beginning, but he was doing it. It turned into a big deal. So, John, uh, you know, just tell the audience uh, some of the woods that you've made you guys have made drums oh, out of. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we've made drums from uh, Royal Ebony, Ivory Ebony. Those are, are, they grow in Laos. And so, and now there's, the, the supply chain's getting very, very low. So you got to get grandfathered in to buy these things. Um, Mapa Burl is a very big seller for us. So I go to um, Finland for that. And it's a lot of these guys take care of it and cut it the way I want it in Karlsruhe, Germany. So you're bouncing around the world, you know, trying to meet these people. And these relationships take a long time to, you know, happen. And these people used to go, well, you, if you want that, you got to buy the whole tree. And I go, God, 
I can't go home to Don and tell him I bought another tree. So that was in the beginning. And now these people have become such good friends. When they come to the States, they stay in my house where we are right now. And um, those precious relationships. And I buy things at a, at a cost that the average Joe doesn't get. And um, not only that, but it's just the, the relationship really builds a lot of character in both of us. And uh, so, you know, Mapa Pearl, Olive Ash Okay, Pearl, you got to tell the story and now. That, 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 now uh, that part, of, part of the genius of John is just like keeping his eyes open, figuring out how to skin the next cat in terms of the type of woods we want. And on your desk forever, you had hmm. almond. How, this is an unbelievable story, how he connected with a person that could supply us almond wood because it were, was impossible to find anybody forever. Yeah, I, I had, somebody brought me this, this little piece of wood that was so heavy. I mean, it's like threw my back out trying to pick it up. So I sent it over to um, my friend in uh, Michigan, Don Sadler. And he goes, stay away from this as, as firewood. It's just junk. It's no, it doesn't, nobody's ever made veneer out of this. And I can tell you why. It's unbelievably hard. It's really hard wood. So anyway, I, so I said, okay. And he, he cut it into a block, sent it back to me. And it's this hard, heavy thing that's been on my desk for 15 years. The paperweight on his desk today. It, it truly is. Yeah. And so people admire it. So we're never going to find a person that could supply us. So I had this dream about making this, you know, making this happen. So I go to I, I go to this uh, everywhere I go in the world. They find out I like to sit in this chair or at that table or whatever. And so I had my chair in this Italian restaurant, and uh, so I sat on the that chair every Friday night. And I knew everybody, the bartender, you know, would tell me what's going on. The, the waitresses would come up, and they were wonderful. And, you know, the owner of the company, great. You get a big hug outside. So I go in one day, and there's some guy sitting in my seat, in my chair. And I look at everybody. It's just another chair in the restaurant, by the way. It doesn't have, in most cases, it doesn't have a name on it. But it's, it's a specific place. So I said... You know, I said to Esther, my God, um, and I started to melt down inside over stupid, idiot things like this. Anyway, so she just grabs my arm, says, just be cool, be cool. So I sit next to this guy. Who's sitting in your chair. It's who's sitting in my chair, and uh, I'm, I'm melting. So he's lonely because he's been down, uh, his wife's in Italy or something, and, I, and he's talking to Esther, who's the most – Wonderful conversationalist you'll ever know. And they're talking past me, so I'm, like, letting this happen. Finally, he says, uh, so so what do you do? I said, well, I make instruments. You know, and he, I said, uh, what do you do? He goes, well, I'm in marketing, but my wife's family is all farmers. And I said, well, what do they farm? And he said, almond. And he said, do you know the correct pronunciation? I said, Ammon. And this guy goes, he became a dear, dear friend. A week later, we're on a plane up to uh, Sacramento. And, and we travel into this little town called Arbuckle. And for, for any of the people who might see this or even care about this story, there's a, a YouTube video of this if you go to our site. Anyway, we go up there. I meet the most glorious, wonderful people. And, you know, when a tree gets old, it stops giving almonds, almonds. So they just push them over with a big, heavy truck and just throw it into a fire. You can buy it at Ralph's or Vaughn's here in California. It's firewood, yeah. It's firewood. So anyway, um, that firewood became drums for me. I put people through hell 
to make veneer. And to this day, no one else but us, we nobody else has made veneer. They, they just can't believe it can happen. You put it into a drum kit, and I think you've played it, Randy, right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's got the most incredible deep sound uh, I've ever. It's heard. beautiful. And it and it's it, really it, pretty too. It just didn't have an almond ranch. He had the biggest. It was like huge, huge. It was like they were doing. You know, there's eight hundred thousand square feet or, or acres, excuse me, of uh, almond in that area, and we supply eighty five percent for the rest of the world. So anyway, I I said, well, how much do you supply? And they went. 100,000. I'm going, you guys are big. Nope. They're just like regular farmers, you know, uh, real nice people. Big deal is just going to have dinner and and just talk about simple things. I'd loved, you know. And so those are part of the relationships we're talking about that you just don't get. You, you just, I don't know how you get them. I don't know how I got it. But it was a magic for that guy to sit in my chair. And so we've gone on from there. And actually, that guy, Jonathan Zeely is his name, uh, has sold almond now to uh, the aircraft industry and everything. They're, they're now, Don Sadler's making veneer out of this stuff. Well, and it gets back to another, I guess, cr critical point from your business venture is uh, those relationships that you've built over the years have become critical to your success. Absolutely. And um, my biggest uh, problem that I've got going on right now, next to the fact that my health gave out, is that it's coming back. Always. It's coming back. So I just want to figure out who I can leave not not leave the world, but just at one point, Don and I both have to retire. He won't. I will. I did. I did. I'm I'm down to eight hours a day. So I figured that's, I figured that's a hell of a start. So, uh, yeah, that, you know, you know, I use that with my wife Susan. She's not buying that yet, but. <laughs> well, I love. I mean, I, I am spending time on the R and D side. Fortunately for both of us. Uh, my son, Chris, has taken over the CEO position. And as the company grows, it gets to a point, mm -hmm. which I saw when I was running it, where at the end of the day, I'm just like, here's another day where 80% of my time is on things that have to do with running a business, not making drums. That's what got us here. You know, I wasn't able to work. So yeah. I wanted to stay on the inventive side of it and John do what he did, me do what I did and have somebody else, you know, coordinate that, but take, take the reins of all of the requirements you have to adhere to to be in business in california and that's it's almost a full-time job just keeping up with all of those all of those issues yeah. i mean so, just today you know this this whole mana thing was crazy you're gonna love to see this uh when it comes out it's gonna be an absolute yeah, jewel can't wait. it's all inlaid wood and it's beautiful it's the we, snare drum we're talking about yeah snare drum and it's, you know, the background now is going to be uh, dyed uh, gray bird's eye. And so once I got that going, I'm talking from my little office, which if I swung this thing around, this is where I do business from these days. And, uh, yeah. And I, I found out that, that he's in town, Alex Gonzalez, and it's just amazing that, the, the idea is the, the wherewithal to do it, to come up with this, this thing, just all happens, you know. And I'm so excited. When Don walked in the door today, I said, oh, you, you got it. You got to dig what had just happened. And it was just, it's just so much fun to, to be enthusiastic after 50 years. And I think what John's saying is just typifies all 50 years. I mean, here we are excited about ideas and artists has given us and things we can do for them. And the artists have been a huge part of all the inventions we've come up with and our success through the years. So it's just, it's, 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 it's a matter of understanding their needs 
having them tell us what they want and being able to produce it. Sometimes you're producing something that's just so eclectic. It's just for that one guy because nobody else in the world probably would ever have something. But 90% of the time, there's at least a version of what he wants that would be acceptable by, if not the masses, a good percentage of his specific fans. Thinking of Terry Bozio as an example. I mean, nobody else is going to play with, you know, 11 bass drums, but, but adding a third bass drum or a fourth or adding other melodic ideas or rhythmic <laughs> ideas to his kit, you know, a lot of people have done that. And he always said to me, I'm hearing an F. Where am I going to get an F? So, of course, I got to make the shell and timbre match it and find that F. So through him, I think I've developed a pretty good pitch. Yeah, yeah. Because I used to timbre match all the drums myself. Right. And now I, now I can't, unfortunately. But I have, you know, instructed the other people that, that could do it. He used to hit on all the drums for a good 25 years. And that would be every drum shell that would come out when it would before it would get made and after we would assemble it. And I would say, John, you're going to get carpal tunnel <laughs> from tuning all these drum shells that he keeps doing. <laughs> Fortunately, he never did. Never got it. Anyway. So, you know, I, I've been to your plant, uh, your operation several times and have got to meet uh, and walk through uh, many of the people that work for you. And one of the thing that one of the things that always strikes me is the family atmosphere that you have created in 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 a large shop. Uh, and uh, just talk a little bit about that, because, you know, I always feel like that that. Everybody there uh, is, really enjoys working there. It's a it's a family atmosphere. I know there's people there, people there that have been there twenty five plus years, uh, multiple family members working there, and uh, so often today we see uh, many uh, in private and and public sector not really focusing on the talent that you know is developing what they're doing and. Uh, so could you guys talk a little bit about well, that? Well, it goes back to the earlier conversation about this this guy who knocked on the door. Way back in Gardena, I think it was in 76? Uh, would have been 77, yeah. Yeah, yeah somewhere in there. And um, we kind of like fell in love with the, the fact that these people really wanted to work. And work is one thing. Talking about it is another thing, but these people really wanted to make stuff. And so then all of a sudden, this son would grow up and he's old enough to come in and start doing whatever we're doing, you know, turning cranks and running machinery. And little by little, it seemed like this family came. And, it, and Don and I were always really cautious about, I don't know, the, the, the family. And when you finally give the the front door keys to these people and you're comfortable and you don't have to necessarily be there, they know they got to open up at 6.30 in the morning. You know, have everybody else waiting in their cars at 6 o'clock. You know, it's cool. And right now we're running shifts from 5 o'clock. In the morning, yeah. Oh, we're trying to keep up with the demand. We've got – a stupid amount of million dollars on that quarter right now. And I'm not helping it because I'm making more things happen. And more I, custom I, things happen, but that's what, that's what keeps the excitement going. You know? yeah. And I think it's, it, it's, there, there is when you, when you look at not only the, the individual people we have working there, but I think there's the key to success is having somebody to feel proud about what they're doing. Yes. You want to pay them fair. You want to increase their pay based on the amount of time that they're there. But no matter what you pay somebody, it's not going to make him feel proud about what he's doing. And that's that's what makes you look forward to going to work in the morning. They know that they're a, a, a cog in the machine that's making the best product that's possible for the end user. Uh, and, uh, and when they see these guys coming through the factory – uh, who play these drums or they go home and they see them on TV, just like we do. It's just like, Hey, I put the lugs on that drum. I sanded that drum. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, they all, they all see the, the fruits of their labor, right? Right in front of them every, every single day. And that's, 
that's a that's something that money can't buy. Just because they're proud good. to come to work. Yeah, it's exciting for all of us to be. And, um, they, and as as the company grew, you know, there there was no front office. I mean, we were both in the back. I was boxing pedals. John was making everything. So it was like there, there was no front and back. We were all into it together for all those years. And the Lombardi family has played the biggest role. I mean, there's Chris. We had Carrie involved. I think Carrie. we had um, um, Polly was Polly at one yeah, point. Yeah, right. So that, but, I mean, there again, uh, I utilized as much child labor as I could as my kids were growing up. <laughs> I have to say they were 13 when they were working in the factory, but they were still in school and did well too. But you, again, you got to instill them. And Carrie, my daughter, is, is runs our whole intellectual property, which is a huge part of the company. Uh, patents and, uh, and and trademark issues. And Chris is uh, really a dynamic businessman. Yeah, and to, to, to weave us through the last two years has been. A full time job for somebody, and he's been doing it. I mean, yeah. it's been literally a full time job. Just seeing how they navigate all the supply chain issues, price increases, which continue on, which is another whole, we could do another whole show on that. Yeah, we could. Yeah. Just an amazing challenge, I think, for anybody that's manufacturing today is uh, the whole supply chain issue. Yeah. Well, again, I applaud you for the people that you brought together because, you know, as I walk through the plant and meet people like, Louie and Gigi and Sean and Jose and Steve and many others. I mean, uh, every one of them. Uh, and, of course, Chris. I've met Chris several times. The commitment that they have to uh, the quality and the vision that you guys had uh, when you first started is is evident throughout your employees, whether they've been with you for several months or, you know, 20-plus years. And I think that's a testament to the I think the investment uh, uh, that you've made not only in them from a financial standpoint, but also the investment that you've made in them uh, from a personal standpoint and really caring about them as, as human beings. And uh, I think it's really evident. But I want to end with today, if I could, with I have a question for you. You know, there's a lot of young people that'll, that'll be watching. I hopefully will be watching this. And you know, they're, they're, they're probably just on the front end of what they're, they're going to do in their lives. And so what, what would you leave with them? What are, what are some takeaways that you would leave with them about as they start to pursue their own journey, uh, whether it be manufacturing uh, the next drum set or, you know, making the next computer or whatever that is? What would you leave with them? The, the words, if there is word, a word wisdom that works with us, I think it lays more with Don, but for myself, when I look at people who want to work or make a difference in manufacturing, what we can do with this world and turn it around and make people happy in our small you know, corner of the world is to, to find passion. Once you've got passion and you can feed that passion, Man, oh man, you got ideas. Everyone's got a, a brain. And if you want to use it the right way, you just get yourself in gear with passion. You come to me or Don with that kind of drive, and you still won't believe what we can let you do. Because we love people who, and, and we've got, we, we start with a, we're steering this way, and they get on board. Before you know it, some people that I've found with, with passion, we're going a little to this direction, and I'm going, whoa, whoa. And it, but it's because they're so good at it, you know. We don't forget our roots, and our roots always start with Don. Wow. I think I agree with John completely. I think you have to find your passion. You have to follow it. And I would also say don't spend two seconds of your life being upset if you make a mistake uh, because you're going to make them. We made many of them as we were developing the company. We had many obstacles as we were developing the company. And you just, in some way, we were able to come together and actually have a laugh out of it. And you just immediately pick yourself up and do it again and try it. And if that fails, you just pick yourself up and do it again because each one of those becomes a learning experience more than a mistake. And 
the more time you spend being upset, oh, oh, this shouldn't be right, or you didn't do this, or I didn't get paid enough for that, uh, the more time you're taking away from doing something positive and creating something. So uh, kind of in, in, embrace the things that don't go well and correct them as soon as you can without spending a moment being upset or angry at yourself. Just realize that that's, that's part of the journey and that's what it takes in order to get to where you, where you want to be. Great, great advice. Well, I thank you for that. And I thank you for everything you do for your people and your plant. Uh, Cause you know, I know a lot of them and uh, I appreciate thank you, you taking the time to, to sit and t- chat with me today. My, thank my you. pleasure, our pleasure. Our pleasure too. Thank you so much, Randy. Thanks for listening to the Leadership Crucible podcast. If you have a story of adversity you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. Visit us at theleadershipcruciblepodcast.com and join us next time as we continue to explore how to live lives of success and significance.